Good evening, Namaskar, Namaste. I'm Shudeep Sen, sitting in New Delhi at the moment, and my co-host. Indra Namathan Aigam, I'm in Washington, D.C. And our colleague, uh, Dawn Krieger, who's sitting in Philadelphia. We meet like this once every month with a host of international writers and poets. Just to give you a quick background, uh, way back in the late 80s, Indra and I met or was it early 90s, late 80s actually. Um, I was at the School of Journalism at Columbia University and England was also there and that's how we first met. And we started the series PWSI Poets and Writers Studio International in my flat in Manhattan. And it was a very Indian style batik thing. People used to leave their shoes outside. We would sit on the durries and my, you know, it was a student apartment. So I had just one chair and that chair became the sort of throne, the podium, and one light shining on the poet. We would pass the hat around and whatever we collected was divided into three or four, whatever the readers are. In fact, in the uh, preceding audio and the visuals you saw, we even tracked down the first poster we made. It was kind of typed out, <laughs> pre-computer days and, um, Yes, yeah, so that's how it started. And so this year we revived it online and it's been wonderful to just sort of get back and get people we like. So Indra usually chooses two poets. I choose two poets and that's how it is. And we've had a fantastic, fantastic season one and this is season one, episode two. Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, yes, it's been, a, it's been a, a really good innings and uh, we're still batting, not out uh, um, over more than a day at the wicket. Um, let's, let's, we're going to begin today with a wonderful poet and, uh, and a wonderful editor as well, Mark Vincennes, uh, and, a, and a dear friend. Mark is based in, in upstate uh, New York, uh, somewhere close to- um, West, Western Massachusetts. Oh, sorry, Western Massachusetts, my apologies somewhere close to where Herman Melville uh, wrote Moby Dick. But let me just give you a few details of this very international resume. Mark um, Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist, and a musician. He has published and 15 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, uh, which came out from Station Hill Press, Here Comes the Night, Dust from Salmon Poetry, and Einstein, Fledermaus from Sun Vision Books. His newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Delights, was just released from Spite and Dieful. New York Press. An album of music, ambience and verse, left hand clapping, is forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincent is, to say the least, also a prolific translator and has translated from the German, Romanian and French. He has published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by the award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz, that came out from White Pine in 2018, uh, and which was uh, a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in translation. His translation of Klaus Mertz's selected poems, An Audible Blue, is forthcoming, also from White Pine Press in the fall. Vincennes, as I mentioned before, is editor and publisher. His home press is Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing, an important anthology. Uh, that assembles the best in American uh, writing. He has lived all over the world, from Brazil to China, to Iceland, to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the Peak in Hong Kong, but now lives, as we mentioned, on a farm in rural Western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain, and where there are more striped skunks, red-backed salamanders, and Eastern hog-nosed snakes than people. Well, you know, 
it's quite a bio, Mark, and you know, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you with us this morning. Well, this morning in the East Coast in the United States, this evening in India. Go ahead, Mark. Look forward to hearing you. Welcome. Um, this, these poems all come from uh, a collection uh, I finished uh, not long ago, uh, but was already accepted uh, for publication by an Australian press uh, for next year. Uh, it's called There Might Be a Moon or a Dog. I was always on an airplane. And this poem also appeared in Indran's fantastic uh, Beltway Review as well. I was always on an airplane. So was my old man. He loved the Caipirinhas in Rio on a Friday night, the pork fried dumplings in Lanjo, roller skating on friendly piers in Brighton and Folkestone, that sitting on the hood of a Jaguar somewhere in the south of France, and the girls, the girls. He sought an alliance with his red wine glass over Brizago's or Davidoff's across the bar from Gina Loda Brigida making eyes. And the hard wind from the Gobi Desert poured in at the Jenk War Hotel in Peking in the gardens and the fountains refurbished by a corporation from the Surrey Hills. And he loved to wander in the crags and gullies and outcrops. Even later, when much had been seen, he loved feeling the mud on his boot, hiding behind cows to dodge bulls, leaping fences no matter how tall, uh, and the glory and the fall or the rattle of the 747 at 10,000 feet. He was vulgar and noble, wanted to boldly go, but the mythical kingdom was out of his reach. To him, a griffin was a cocktail in the bar at the wall of Astoria before the Chinese bought it. In every family's bed, there might be a moon or a dog, or in the inkwell on that old desk in the basement, atoms from that incident at Chamonix, a savage debasement on the edge of the known world, or the fireflies at Place de la Concorde. The daily papers say what they say, but in the darkness of the barracks somewhere, in Heilongjiang, as you sip your papst blue ribbon, thanking the soldiers for their indecision and for their inquisition on the nature of pubic hair. Was the hair on your head the same? Or the house fire buzzing on the window pane? Or the crowds converging in the light outside, gathered here, concerning a certain dictator with his perpetuum mobile, and the five-star general on Easter day with his marches and parades and all those love letters carelessly tossed from the balconies. And the next poem, um, is called The Venetian Diaries for James Joyce. One minuscule, Everything converges for a second, then comes this dance, an electrical rising rainbow dance, a world of circular poetry, all those lovely mysteries, the Bengal nights and the teak bedside cabinet, yesterday's batteries, and obarred by flashlight. Suck on that licorice stick, find the mouth of your tunnel. Yes, I'm queasy this evening, this mad compact. What is it? Ah, theory. All those theories, ice more deeply groomed, staring at the crystalline, just the sight of it. We shuddered. We let our hair free fall in the vast rooms, the Lido overlooking Hemingway's martinis, leaning out of these 17th century balconies in that postcard scenery, haughty by temperament, then that lazy creak of the door. Two, for those who claim to be good, who are those crony capitalists? Do they keep themselves on ice where martinis have no claws? Whether a woman enters his chambers or not, what a blaze, eh? Such vivid blooms, such consoling winds, and the loveliest of all, cross-legged on the face of a daisy, watching the mountains rising. Far in the distant ocean, that isle exists, that Robinson Crusoe forgotten isle that vanishes in the lazy heat. Foreigners are announced by their fragrances, not the mast looming 20 feet over the horizon or the number of cannons or the mermaid who guides you into her pleasure, into her deep. Three, scratching the dirt like a hen. Occasionally it appears at the end of a sentence or in mid-swim as the fingers curl to the water 
in those caravels of tenderness on a country walk through the grimiest part of the city where the ground gives way, the turning point when you are living closer to the almighty and the bleating of the sheep in the furthest meadows circles everything. Are you that blue-eyed man who gives his hands over to this very moment of purest joy? This is the rise and fall of the great facade of what and whom it possessed. Yes, he was a light, cheerful man, they said, but the shore carried his current out to sea, and in between the drams of whiskey, the constant tearing up of streets, the lack of light on those fanciful evenings, the small aims and the goodbyes. After 10 more years, the cat will surely gaze eagerly out the window. Four, Ulysses, the companion you feared the most on the other side of the century, the ghost of someone you know who had the nuance of a spork. My, what big eyes you have. Five, seminary. The eight-pointed tower and the noise of the footsteps, the morning filled with crows. This roar opens up toward the city and we enter its eye, clinging like spiders to the ramparts and buttresses, the chain and the hardwood, the tile in a tinted glass. Oh, hard heart of illimitable wisdom, those wily stares with words sweet as summer nectar. I beg for your silent becoming through the wantonness and the sorrow where sunset looms immortal on the skin of the sky. Six wings of fire. Everything's done for in a second or two. Those you feared the most are returning and with them, the pigeons and the crows, the juniper and the laurel, the flower and the garden and the snake and the seed and the twins and the flood, even though the flood and on to the blasphemous Bosphorus, where wild sea creatures like the Kraken and the Gyrex, the Scylla and the Chabadis, the Rabhan and the Leviathan roam the sinister waves. Go through this sweet spell, child, as upon the desert wind, snort and puff like any wild thing where swallows arc and spin. But don't be deceived, this is the pull of the sea. Seven, from that rapturous deep. A quiet spell, almost sleep, but more something like what one gives to death or an anodyne that forgives what's left, like the eyes of the peregrine scanning again to the horizon or deep in the clouds. Again, those dreams of that perfect state of bliss performed by the acrobat of the soul, a state of who I am, a finishing off of other poetries, of harmless little tricks scattered about the world. Eight, and fortune favors the bold. In manganese and iron, we vent forth. We don't believe what we do not know, just what we hear. The snort and puff of any city bristling in its heft and sway. Why do you call me a poet, they say, making me a mirror of sentimentality, sentimentality and old bones. Wither the spirit, capture the sun pressed flat in the palm of your hand like a wafer or a tiny Dutch pancake, like bread from dust. Nine, in your own oven. You chase the one spark who had a name, a little sneer of a spark, a dart, an enigma, a fleck of brute time. If I were a billionaire, I might raise the cobwebs and peek inside. Father, oh father, from whence did you arise? My heart's heavy cobblestone, my eternal flower in the breeze. Oh, I know those high-blown ideals, the beach, the seas, pounding in their well-worn waves. Agony to die like this, with the inexpressible nothing sitting on the tongue. To be freed of all the grief would be something. I think you'd agree. And I think uh, some people may note that that was somewhat inspired by the whole oh. pandemic as well. Yeah. This one's called uh, Aerial Feats Over the City. I will still be young, she said, on the day of her death. But before then, I shall have my cream cakes and tea. And as she arose, the words no longer came to her throat. It was as if all those efforts from the past seemed unnecessary. And that night on every roof and chimney top, a kind of nostalgia permeated the restless air. You could see it in the doves, 
and their strange formations on the gutters that they splayed across the roof tiles. They muttered and gossiped that they were weary, always waiting for the last customers to arrive. But there was a form way above this, just above the wind, but beneath the clouds, and taking full advantage of the bright moon, plummeting in a fiery cry of the fallen until they finally hit the hard earth, splitting into a million loud voices, clamoring at the drains and the sewers. My reason for living once, she said long ago, was the joyous and ferocious men, big bearded and sometimes sullen with minds like razors. Now lightheartedly, she inconsistently leaves this planet. Well, no, not really. Only my particulars ever, ever actually leave the planet. Many lived experiences are still unknown in the upper layers of the stratosphere who now and then mysteriously reappear. Wading through piles of garbage. Oh, that thrill underneath your feet of an artificial ski slope built on yesterday's refuse. It gives way, but not too much, like walking on a sponge or a thick rubberized yoga mat. Barefoot, it's the polymers that give it that bounce. Thousands of creatures have found their way in here. Salamanders, snakes, newts, crickets, ants, and weevils. Wait, here's a broken body wheezing, a slightly hunched back TV screen, a radio that once had the privilege of speaking to the unemployed. To think that a god made this out of her leftover dreams and desires, and that longing for four rooms and a balcony or built-in air conditioning, those thousand drawers once filled the old char armchairs sprung here. A small antique table carved with a fleur-de-lis and this beautiful square of yellow plastic curving towards sunlight. Right now, a sparrow flits between the peaks and overhead, the seagulls dive bomb the troughs. Every once in a while, there's a squawking frenzy. What a treasure, they're singing. What a treasure. This is the last one, and it's called The Last Descendant. In the not too distant future, in some distant sun system, the engines of the economy will go silent. On lunar holidays, the consortium will meet to discuss soft matters, wafer thin trinkets of colored glass, the red moon on the horizon, the gentle moss covered hills with their panoply of shimmering beetles. They will celebrate the union of the source the wind and water dust, the hanging foxes in the caverns of Pantum, or the light giving lodgings awake in song and reverie. You won't understand until you start hearing it, the heartbeat of the night blossoms and their attending creatures who recite poetry behind the old people's home. Amongst the hundred eyes at dinner time, behold the paprika sprinkled on the cinnamon river. Watch the yew birds rise strumming the glass grasslands in their plumes. It has been said that all is done for, that the world no longer holds. For a while, some places grow, glow in harmony. Still others, with their torches and magnets, will blemish the way. And just who is this obstinate group who simply hands over their skins? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful. Well, You're such a gifted, uh, the phrases stick out, you know, watch the you birds rise and, 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 and many other, I couldn't uh, cut and paste correctly the last mm -hmm. couple of poems, so I decided not to butcher them in the chat, but otherwise uh, we have a good selection of your work there. Look, look, um, there's much to talk about, but I mean, I'm curious about your influences, you know, and the poets who've, yeah, who've shaped you, you read uh, today. I mean, you know, I hear ghosts of, of Eliot and, of, and of, of, of so many uh, in your work. And of course, you're talking about the last descendant at the end. So inevitably, one thinks of the wasteland and all of its descendants. So tell, tell us about your origins as a poet, your first readings, and uh, who, who shaped your work. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, well, the very beginning was uh, in high school in the US, actually. I had an English teacher who, who basically showed me, you know, E. Cummings, uh, uh, Tennyson, Wordsworth, 
Um, and later on, of course, uh, uh, William Carlos Williams and uh, W.B. Yeats, uh, an old favorite of mine, actually. Um, and I, I was hooked from them. Um, I really started out as a sort of singer songwriter. And I was writing mostly lyrics, um, but I then just gravitated to poetry. Um, and since then, I've tried my best to read every single thing I can get my hands on by every single poet. Um, but I should say um, my own tendencies, my own tastes lean toward uh, the Eastern European poets, particularly the Polish poets, uh, uh, the Czechs and the Hungarians. Um, and also, to a certain degree, uh, some of the Nordic poets, uh, the Swedes and Norwegians, um, Thomas Tranström, I, um, I, I very much enjoy, for example, um, and um, been very inspiring to me. Um, right now, I'm reading um, something quite different. I'm reading uh, Henri Breton and Philippe uh, Sopon, The Magnetic Fields, um, which is um, an absolutely insane piece of work. Um, um, but it's, it's kind of staggering in, in its own right uh, that, that they basically wrote it uh, back and forth in one sitting. You know? um, just, yeah. you know, I don't know if they were doing opium or something, but uh, it certainly has that feel about it. I wonder uh, if the poem allows one to be insane in a, in a legal sense, you know, <laughs> writing the line out. Um, but fascinating. Um, I, 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 Sudip, go ahead and I, I'll come back with some Mark, more. Mark, uh, yes. Uh, Mark, I, this is, there's so much to talk about. Actually, well, one, one of the things we find is, you know, each poet is just so strong that you can actually have a solo reading and have a focused discussion in each poet. But maybe I'll just concentrate on your first poem, uh, The Venetian oh. Diaries, which I think is extraordinary. You know, the way you construct it, the dense phraseology, the way you use... Uh, um, almost the Hop Hopkins sort of mid sentence uh, breaks rather than end, end rhymes. Um, it's almost biblical in scope in some ways, but very, very contemporary, very, very tightly wrought. And one of the things that it reminded me was uh, Brodsky's um, The Water, mm. uh, the, the little novella, well, not quite little. Um, and it's 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 quite thrilling that you know as an American poet, it's it's rare that I find American poets uh, terribly interested in much beyond the their own country or perhaps you know UK. But the fact that you had a list of Eastern European poets and the Nordic poets was quite refreshing. Tell me about the sonic quality because I was I, when I read the poems for the first time. I read it, uh, read them as elongated lines, and I read them out quite differently from the way you read it. So the way you read it, as it appeared to me, uh, was sort of phrase breaks according to breath pauses. Would you like to talk a little bit about the way you you sound, perhaps? Oh, sure. Um, I mean, um, John Scoyles, the editor of Plowshares always says to me that I, I could read a telephone book and it would sound like poetry. Um, <laughs> so I have, I have that, that luck, I, I, I should say, <clears throat> to have that kind of a voice. Um, and, you know, I, as a child, um, I, was, I was very much into acting and the whole singer-songwriter thing. Also, the, the tonal qualities of the music, of the, of the, of the words, um, plus the fact that I, I speak uh, six languages and I was brought up in many countries around the world uh, and listened to many, many other languages. So I guess I have kind of developed my own sonic rhythm um, in, in the work I write. And um, it's only more recently that I, I've been writing more prose poems um, rather than line break poems. Um, but, you know, for example, I, I've just sort of made the decision in life. If it, I, I'll, I write books, you know, I, I don't really write individual poems and then stitch a book together. So I'm always working on a book of some sort. Um, and so each of the poems is also, uh, you know, influenced upon itself. But nowadays, when I work on the book, you know, I'll know suddenly just this is going to be a line break poem and this is going to be a prose poem. Um, and, and I think it's fine to switch back and forth. It's kind of interesting for the reader as well. Um, I mean, on a page. Um, I always loved, uh, you know, E. Cummings' fabulous, uh, you know, designs and, and uh, 
and the the symbolism he managed to get out of the image on the page as well. You know? um, or, or even people like say Denis Levitov, uh, the way she arranged uh, lines on the page. But but it's interesting that you talk about um, writing as a book project. Yes, because immediately that sparks different kinds of triggers when it comes to writing of a piece or a long piece. Uh, you think differently. It's more elastic in a sense, especially well, when I look at the poem, uh, The Venetian Diaries. Well, is that I, something that is consistent in, 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 in much of your work? Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. And, um, you know, um, I think, I mean, basically every single time I'm write, writing a book, today I don't even, worry about whether it's a, a book of poetry or even a book of fiction. I just finished a novel, for example, um, uh, which is the second novel I've written. The first one was you know, over 20 years ago. So I actually haven't been reading uh, or writing much fiction at all, um, um, but it just kind of popped out. But in a way, I think it's actually a novel in prose poems. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm seeing if it's possible. <laughs> To sell it to the commercial market as a novel, you know, um, we'll see. We'll see if they accept it. Otherwise, you know, I'll just go back to my experimental publisher's roots and then uh, have it published. Right. That's fine. I mean, let me just throw out the a sort of maybe a standard question, but I would mean, make it new, right? I mean, we all have this sort of adage that we grew up with as poets. I'm wondering how does that apply to your work? I mean, how what what are you making new? How are you making it new? What is it because you're working as uh, in the book as opposed to the individual poem is it because of your the six oh. languages you speak i mean oh, well, talk is, about that the question is first to you to is am i making it new well, i i believe you are but i think you are also connecting yourself to surrealism to to different traditions oh, and i'm no. just wondering how not how really one separates oneself okay, not really, go ahead. Not really. Go ahead. I, I i don't um I don't really think about whether I'm writing, you know, speculative work or, or you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, sort of a historical narrative or um, it, it's just my work. And um, of course, I admire and appreciate all the traditions, language, poetry, surrealism, um, Dadaism, um, and, you know, I enjoy all of them. Um, so I'm sure some of those, those influences have also crept in here and there. Um, but I, I, get, I let it have its own life, really. Um, I don't really try and categorize it in my own mind anyway. Of course, yeah, no, no, I, I, I just like should, to do that. That's another story. You know? Sure, I think we should destroy these categories. But at the same time, you do have an English English in your, in your verse. I mean, it, it comes inevitably from your roots or born in Hong Kong and then and moving from there. But I mean, you have, a, you have that in your language, in your rhetoric. I, as opposed to an American English, <laughs> so I'm just saying, but there's a- For Sure, a I mean, actually, on, on the American English side, I've learned a lot from my wife, uh, who, although now is a doctor, used to be an actress, um, and, uh, you know, can do pretty much any American accent you give her, she'll just sort of whip it out, um, and knows kind of the nuances of the little, little areas, or kind of, you know, catchphrases or slang they use, um, which is also, you know, quite, quite interesting um, and I don't think has been explored anywhere near enough kind of uh, the, the, the linguistic properties of the different, shall we say, dialects or, or accents across the United States um, in poetry, you know. Um, I think that that would be an interesting project. Maybe, yeah. I'll, maybe I'll give that a go. <laughs> Please, you could yeah, be a kind of anthropologist of poetry, and and the work can end up in the Smithsonian, you know, and 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 be, be studied and and listened to as well, because you could also record the work. Yeah, go ahead. I think that's a good good note to move on to the next poet. Thank you so much. Mark. Thank you very much. Thank excellent. you. Really excellent. We'll come back at the end and you know have general uh, questions and discussions, and people get into a conversation that will happen later. But that's it's my it's my great privilege and treat to introduce a very, very old friend, a dear friend, Arundhati Subramanian. We started our so-called poetry publishing life more or less around the same time in India. She from Bombay, I was in Delhi. And I'm happy to say that I consider 
uh, Arundhati, one of the finest Indian poets who are writing today. So it's a real treat for me personally, and it will be a treat for all of you to hear her. But I must read the bio out in a more formal way because that's important to give um, importance to a poet. And it's also on the sidebar in the chat. Arundhati Subramaniam is the author of 13 books of poetry and prose. Her most recent collection, Love Without a Story, was published by Blood Axe in 2020, was described as a breathtaking and heartwarming book, according to the Poetry Book Society Bulletin. A unique poet of our times, according to the Society Academy magazine, the Indian Literature. Shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize in 2015, she is the recipient of the Sahitya Academy Award in 2020. The inaugural Kushwan Singh Prize, the Raza Award for Poetry, the El Cepo Award in Italy, the Mystic Kalinga, and the Homi Bhaba and Charles Wallace Fellowships, amongst many others. Other books include the recently launched book of essays, on female spiritual travelers, women who wear only themselves, came out just this year. And the much acclaimed Penguin Anthology of Sacred Poetry, you must get hold of this, called Eating God. She has worked over the years as a performing arts curator, critic, a poetry editor. She's also a trained Bharatanatyam dancer, which she doesn't put on her bio, and I think that aspect of her training, I think for me, it's a poetry. And now she very glamorously divides her time between Bombay, Madras, and New York. <laughs> Arundhati, a real treat. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Shadeep. Thank you, Indran. Thank you for making this happen. And what a wonderful reading, Mark. In fact, in response to that, I was actually inclined to pick up some uh, pick up a, a poem cycle and read it, but I know that we've made some choices and I think it makes sense as should be pointed out to have those uh, poems um, displayed alongside the reading. So I'm going to resist the temptation to read a poem cycle to you following Mark's inspiration. And instead I will read a poem that also seems um, opposite given that Shudeep invoked friendship at the start of this uh, session and the start of this introduction. And um, this is a poem to friends and uh, friends that are, and I see some here and friends that will be a tribute that may not sound like a tribute, but is intended to be one. My friends, this Sodom, the lot of them, leafy with more than a whiff of damage, mottled with history, dark with grime. God knows I've wanted them different, less preoccupied, more jaunty, less handle with care, more airbrushed, less prone to impossible dreams, less perishable, a little more willing to soak in the sun, they don't measure up, they're unpunctual. They turn suddenly tuberous, but they matter for their crooked smiles, their endless distractions, their sudden pauses. Signs that they know how green stems twist and thicken as they vanish into the dark, making their way through their own sticky vernacular tissues of mud, improvising, blundering, improvising. And um, with that, I'd like to move to a poem from my most recent book, which is entitled, I Grew Up in an Age of Poets. And it has an epigraph by the Indian poet Eunice D'Souza, who says in a poem that has remained with me, best to meet in poems. And uh, that became uh, a trigger 
for this particular poem. I grew up in an age of poets. I grew up in an age of poets who told me the joy was for cabbages mm. until I found that beneath their smoking empires of sulfur, there lay a shiver of doubt, that they wondered, as I did, about what it might mean to be leafy, to wilt, to be damaged sometimes by upstart caterpillars and still stay green, chaotically, wetly, powerfully, green. Now, I meet poets who exchange visiting cards, are best friends with the dentist, all dankness deodorized, their poems cool seashells, their laughter splintered eggshells, poets who never seem to wonder about cabbages at all. Still best to meet in poems. And with that, I'd like to move on to a poem called Tongue, also from the same book and also with an epigraph by John Berger, who says, the tongue is alone and tethered in its mouth. Tongue. The man in front of me is reading a balance sheet. He is smiling, his gaze shimmying between columns, effortlessly bilingual. And though a little drunk on the liquor of profit, I like to think that he is not immune to the sharp beauty of integers simmering with their own inner life. And I wonder if he feels the way I do sometimes around words, waiting for them to lead me past the shudder of taproot, past the inkiness of groundwater to those places where all tongues meet. Calculus, Persian, cock baroque, flamenco. The tongue that sparrows know and accountants and those palm trees at the far end of family photographs. Your tongue, mine. The kiss that knows from where the first songs sprang, forested and densely plural. The kiss that knows no separation. And with that, I'd like to move to a poem called Mitti which was actually a poem suggested by a reader of a particular newspaper. The newspaper decided to give us all a word in an Indian language other than English and asked us to make a poem around it. It was the DNA, I think. And the word that was assigned to me was mitti, earth, soil, mud. And my initial response was to decline, but I'm glad I stayed with the word because uh, it became a reflection on mud and more. Mitti. As a child, I ate mud. It tasted of grit and peat and wild churning and something else that I could never quite find a name for. Later, I became a moon gazer, always squinting through windows, believing that freedom was aerial until I figured that the moon was a likely mud gazer, longing for the thick sludge of gravity, the promiscuous thrill of touch, the license to make, break, remake. And so I uncovered the old language of poets to be messengers between moon and mud. And I began to learn the many languages of earth that have nothing to do with nations and atlases, and everything to do with the ways of earwigs, the pilgrim trail of roots, the longing of life to hold and be held, and the irrepressible human love of naming. Ooze, mire, manure, humus, dirt, silt, mold, loam, 
soil, slush, clay, shit, manne, matope, baro, tinen, ni, luto, pango, all have their place, I found, in the democracy of tongues. None superior, none untranslatable, all reminders of the anthem of muck of which we are made. Except when June clouds capsize over an Arabian sea and a sleeping city awakens to an ache so singular that for just a moment it could have no name. Other than that, where soil meets sense and a slop of matter meets a slick lunatic wetness, mitti, just that, nothing else will do. Bravo. Bravo, yeah, wonderful. And uh, I move on to a poem called How to Read Indian Myth, which was actually a response to a, to a question that I was asked uh, in response to the poem cycle that I would love to have read. Uh, a poem cycle around the Mahabharata, which was in my previous book. And someone asked me, but I don't have any access to Indian myths, so how do I read it? And my response eventually became a poem. How to read Indian myths for A.S. Who Wonders. How to read Indian myths? The way I read Greek, I suppose, not worrying too much about foreign names and plots, knowing there is never a single point to any story, taking the red hibiscus root into the skin, alert to trap doors, willing to blunder a little in the dark, slightly drunk on deck of sun, but with a spring in the step that knows that we are fundamentally corky, built to float, built to understand, and that the chemical into which we are tumbling will sustain, has sustained before knows a way through, knows a way beyond, knows that the two aren't separate. Read it like you would read a love story. You're wrong. And that feels like the cue to read, in fact, a story around Indian myth, a poem around Indian myth, which is based on a story that um, many of us in India certainly know about a god called Kartikeya. I don't want to say anything about him really, other than the fact that he is in my poem, what he is in fact in the story, a traveling God, a God looking for, as I see him, for meaning, but a traveler essentially. He has many names. One of them is Subramanya, which happens to be my own name. And I was thinking about, I started one day thinking about what names mean. And that led me to thinking about Kartikeya more deeply. When God is a traveler, wondering about Kartikeya, Muruga, Subramanya, my namesake. Trust the God back from his travels, his voice whole grain and chamomile, his wisdom mean, his peacock, sweaty plume, drowsing in the shadows. Trust him who sits wordless on park benches, listening to the cries of children fading into the dusk, his gaze emptied of vagrancy, his heart of ownership. Trust him who has seen enough. Revolutions, promises, the desperate light of shopping malls, hospital rooms, manifestos, theologies, the iron taste of blood, the great craters that lie in the middle of love. Trust him who no longer begrudges his brother, his prize, his parents, their partisanship. Trust him whose race is run, whose journey remains, who stands fluid stemmed, knowing he is the tree that bears fruit festive with sun. Trust him who recognizes you, abundant, auspicious, battle-scarred, alive. 
and knows from where you come. Trust the God, ready to circle the world all over again. This time, for no reason at all, other than to see it through your eyes. I think I'll conclude there and uh, skip the last poem because I think we're running short of time as well. So happy to stop there. Thank you, Shudeep, and thank you. Oh, Arundhati, it was marvelous, uh, as always. Of course, I know your voice and your reading voice so well that I can just close my eyes and I also know the book really well too. <laughs> so it's it's wonderful to sort of rehear it again. I'm glad actually you chose some of these poems because um, it, it displays to say the Western world, how we use English without English being creolized or English being non-English or English being post-colonial. It's English as we use it. It's one of our mother tongues and the way we are taking the Indian South Asian myths back onto the Western sort of overlaying it with Greek and normally it happens the other way around. Um, I'm saying this because, of course, I know your poetry, but what I'm coming to is your languorous reading voice. And part of me reminds you, reminds me certainly of dance movement, be it Bharatanatyam or Odissi or probably even Mohiniyattam because it's even more circular and sort of sways like a palm. Mohiniyattam, it essentially is an enchantress and um, and then, of course, you have the gods and goddesses. You've done a book of sacred poetry. Tell us, tell the audience, I know, tell the audience the importance of sacred, the idea of sacred in a very, very cosmopolitan world that is now and almost unsacred. Because through your poetry, the beauty of sacredness is um, you, you, you re-worship it in a secular manner. Perhaps you want to talk about that. That's, uh, that's beautifully put, Shadeep. Thank you. I, I certainly feel that um, I grew up like many of us, I suspect, who were deeply suspicious of the many ways and the many expedient ways in which the sacred has been taken over, monopolized by, uh, by various institutions and uh, groups and traditions. But um, I often say when I plunged into a place where that I couldn't quite name or understand, which was for me really a condition of emptiness more than anything else, I became what I would call um, a somewhat desperate seeker. And so when the sacred enters, when the gods enter my poetry, I approach them, I realize later, with the kind of uh, warmth and the affection with which some of the bhakti poets to my mind, the bhakti poets being the devotional poets of India, of the Indian subcontinent, the way in which they um, speak to them, to their particular ishtadetas or their personal gods. And many people think that the, the presence of the gods is in some ways the presence of the sacred, but that is not necessarily so. What I do find interesting to me about the idea of the personal God that we are all heir to, Shadeep, as you know, in the subcontinent, is the fact that you have this extraordinary license, which we may be fast losing today. I like to believe it still endures this extraordinary license to befriend one of these 330 million gods and goddesses that we might want to pick it a la carte off this wonderful menu. And that becomes your personal ally, your personal traveling companion, your inspiration. But if you want, you can invent a god if you don't find one suited to your taste. And if you don't want to invent one, you can dispense with the entire pantheon of gods and goddesses and still continue on your journey towards the sacred or your journey towards freedom. This incredible license, this incredible freedom is one that I would like in some way to celebrate. And I think that 
that affection for that aspect of our tradition, that warmth, that celebration probably enters the work. But so also, I believe, do pauses and silences that might account for what you called earlier the more languid uh, approach. But um, I see it really as the importance of spine, to go back to what you said about dance, the importance of spine in a poem is something that I value. The non-decorative, the strong spine, poise, but uncertainty as well, room for wonder as well, room for silences as well. Uh, that, that, that's just brilliant, the, the notion of spine. Thank you for that. And, and thank you for your, your, hum, your humble poems in a way. I mean, your, your, include, your, 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 your attention to the foibles and the weaknesses of our, of our community of, of worshippers, you know, our community of writers, a community of friends. I mean, the, the poem you write for my friends is, is a beautiful uh, and, and very humanist and humane uh, statement of, and recognition. And, and, and then, and also, I mean, yes, you are a poet in English, but you take this word Mitty and then you make this global poem from it, you know, where you put in fango and you put in words from so many different languages and you point out the common uh, uh, humanity, uh, you know, that, that, so you're connecting your work to poetry and poetry and, and languages throughout the world. So and you write with this clarity of diction, you know, it's 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 a pleasure to for the ear and and it and it flows easily into the mind. You know, you're not interested in in fandanging or you know fun fun is a word I comes to mind which sort of boasting in your verse. You're not boasting in your verse, you're writing it straight and and that's its beauty and it's a classical sort of beauty so yeah well done it's a pleasure it's a, it's a long time ago that we met i, I remember in in chennai and um, it's just wonderful to be able to reconnect and to know of where your career has taken you and and to know that you're not that far away in new york at the moment so <laughs> yes, on the indeed, atlantic indeed. coast yeah um it's good yes. Very good. I, I'm not really, I'm just making a, a praise statement here. I'm not really asking a question. Though I could ask you one question, if I may, and that is, how do you, I mean, who are you reading? I mean, I did ask this of Mark as well. Who are you reading? Um, who have, who, who are the poets who have shaped you in particular? It's always good, I think, uh, for a, somebody new to your work. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the audience uh, to this program some of the audience, um, if you could just guide them a little bit in terms of that genealogy and that history. Mm. It's, uh, I'd say that I start, I mean, there was a whole host of Anglo-American poets who were significant from Wallace Stevens and T.S. Eliot to, you know, Elizabeth Bishop and uh, Adrian Rich and uh, Yates, certainly, who was mentioned earlier, T.S. Eliot, but, and, and later, the Zen poets were very important to me in my teens. They left a certain, particularly Basho, Isa. But uh, it was late. And of course, I should also mention several Indian poets in English. I grew up in, in Bombay, and uh, there was Arun Kolatkar, not very far from uh, where I studied, hunched over his, uh, his plate at the Wayside Inn. And we would, you know, Arun Kolatkar's work is very much part of uh, my heritage. I was reading all of them. Eunice D'Souza, all of them, many of the Indian, Anglophone Indian poets. But I'd say it was later in my life, Indran, that the uh, Bhakti poets became particularly important. I'd grown up with a lot of that poetry uh, because I was interested in dance, but uh, it was later that I reclaimed them as part of my literary ancestry because I needed them. They rescued me. They offered me sanctuary when I needed it. So they've become a very important part of my bloodline the Bhakti poets ranging from Tukaram to Agamacharya to um, Mahadevyakta, Appar, yeah. Akka Mahadevi, certainly yeah. in those wonderful translations by A.K. Ramanujan and uh, several others. So they're part of my, they, I, I think I stopped seeing them as creaky specimens and I began to see them as part of my larger family. And I drew a great deal of uh, support and nourishment from their voices. 
Thank you. Thank you. Arudhati, I want to go back to the poetry again. Um, you used the word a la carte. And when you use the word a la carte, to me, it's sort of, it's very typical of the way you inhabit your poetic space. And by that, I mean, it's very, very cosmopolitan and right now and what's happening. The ordinary things, the ordinary things are just as important as the sacred big gods in the pantheon. Uh, that's probably part of what was Indran alluding to that, you know, it's wonderful to see that you have used both, both ends of the polarity, but have dissolved the hierarchy to make it seamless. So the big G and the small G, if we are talking about the God or the G's as in ideas are very beautifully enmeshed. Um, and in a sense, I mean, you talked about Kulatkar. Kulatkar was exactly like that. Anybody, and I would please suggest this, and all Indian poets, we, we, whenever especially we travel abroad, we say, read Jejuri by Arun Kulatkar. And now there's a wonderful edition by the New York uh, Review of Books, and NYRB has produced a new edition of uh, Kulatkar. But tell us about how you mingle the very, very ordinary, the sometimes even ugly and banal into a kind of a poetic language, because that takes some doing. I'll come to how I do it in a moment, but I'm so glad you also mentioned Kolatkar uh, Shudit, because one of my, I remember this early recollection of Jijuri. <clears throat> and for those who say that it isn't a really a, you know, there is, where is the sacred in that poem? It's a poem of great um, irreverence, certainly, but there is, to my mind, the sacred in the eyes of that old beggar woman, where you least expect to see it. The sacred is not found in the shrine at Jejuri, it's found in the eyes of that old beggar woman. And this capacity also to bring the big and the small into the same frame effortlessly is something that I see in his Kala Ghoda poems, where he speaks of, in the beautiful poem, Breakfast at Kala Ghoda, he speaks of idlis, a good, warm, steaming bowl of idlis and the stars all in the same breath, in the same phrase, in the same image. And this is the quality in Koletkar's work that I've just always admired. As for my own work, I'd say that uh, when some people think one is writing about the sacred, they seem to mean that, seem to believe that it might be to the exclusion of mitti, of mud. And to my mind, that is so completely uh, not the way I have experienced life that I don't see why I would suddenly want to turn into some kind of uh, bubble of vapor. I did hope when I started my own spiritual journey that I would turn into this wonderful tranquil being and uh, more ether than matter, but I realized that wasn't to be and that wasn't the way it was going to be if anything. I experienced body much more intensely and much more viscerally than ever before. So I suppose that some of those hierarchies aren't there because part of the journey has been erasing those very hierarchies and the way one lives and uh, inhabits the self. That's a journey that's still underway, but that is the journey. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank it was beautiful. Um, you know, we'll come back to all of you again, but um, in a way, I think it's, um, I didn't plan it in that way, but in a way, Omar is the right person to follow Arundhati because of the sort of trajectory of things that you talk about. And of course, Omar is going to be reading from his new book, he told me. So uh, but I've read his poetry over time and um, his heritage from, from the Middle East is such an important part of his poetics. Uh, 
even though he writes like a British poet sometimes and maybe speaks like a British poet. And Omar, it's lovely to see you because we've only been on email and I've only seen still photographs of you. So actually you exist as a person and you move. And, and you yeah, smoke. it's not a scam, don't worry. It's not, a, it's not like a scam, I do exist, yes. <laughs> So it's a great treat to have you. He, he's, he, uh, well, let me read out the bio. That would be the best part. Um, and let me just, uh, but it's, he, Omar is, apart from being a very fine poet and a prose writer, I would say he's mostly a poet, is an incredible critic. He's one of the best critics of poetry, I think. I, I, and I follow a lot of criticism around the world and Omar uh, is, is doing, a lot of good work with contemporary poetry from all over the world. That's the wonderful part about his writing. Thank you very much. The longer bio is on the side. Uh, all these young poets have incredibly impressive long bios. So I'm only going to read an abbreviated version. Omar Sabah is a widely published poet, writer, and critic. Over the last decade and a half, his poetry has appeared or will be forthcoming in many venues, such as Poetry Review, The PN Review, Agenda, Acumen, New Humanist, New Writing, The Reader Magazine, Stand, Kenyan Review, New England Review, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, he's published four or five collections of poetry, my only ever eatable complaint to the middle love, to the middle of love, but it was an important failure. And the book he's gonna be reading from, which is called Morning Lit, Portals After Alia. Alia is his beautiful daughter, whose photographs I've seen on Facebook, uh, has written these lovely, lovely, wonderful sequence of, a sequence of poems. He'll be reading from that. He's also published his Beirut novella called Via Negativa, A Parable of Exile, and, and his, a Dubai novella, Minutes from a Miracle City. The cedar never dies. Yeah, that is something in the works. Even Lebanese verse novel. So my God, lots of things and he's super prolific. He holds a BA in PPE from Oxford three MAs, all from the University of London in literature, creative writing, creative and life writing and philosophy, and a PhD in English literature from KCL. Currently, he teaches at the American University in Dubai, where he is associate professor of English. Omar, it's a real treat and pleasure to have you. Warm welcome. Thank you very, very much, Rudy, for the opportunity. Um, to read some of my work, and uh, I do feel a bit abashed in this company because I'm, you know, microscopic compared to some of you guys. So I wanted just to take the advantage of um, adver not adver adverting to some of the contents of my forthcoming book, Morning Lit, Portals After Alia, which is a book um, nearly completely about family poems. Many of them, the majority of them do with my daughter, but, you know, some to do with relationships that are still... Uh, which are still kind of family oriented. Um, the first poem I want to read was, is titled, You Convince Yourself. And I, and sometimes as I do, I put an epigraph at the top of my poems. And often enough, it's strange, but often enough, I haven't planned an epigraph. It was almost like I wrote a poem and about five days later, I remember there was a musical inkling that led to that poem that was actually rooted in a reading of maybe 10 years ago or something. So then I'll go and put that, that, that epigraph in. So the epigraph I'm gonna read is from C.P. C. P. Kavafi's The City, and it runs like this. You tell yourself, I'll be gone, some other land, some other sea, to a city lovelier far than this could have been or hoped to be. So this is You Convince Yourself, one of the prefatory poems of my collection. You convince yourself you'll find a different planet spinning on a different axis each time. So you underplay the kiss given you and the terror that you cannot shield because the world is just that, a mad abyss. 
the terror that comes brimming like liquor, quick to poison, tar, the envy of the stone, bricks that make no home. That terror that you convince yourself will never tally, never find a home. Well, my friend, aren't they the brittle arrows you've always parried, you've always known? Uh, the second poem, I, I tend to write rather short poems in general and within one page, one A4 page. Um, and most of these poems have been published in journals beforehand, but they're ending up in my book. This one is titled Fatherhood. And it's for, of course, my daughter, Alia Sabah. Fatherhood. It happens into life, of course, but very slowly. The same tongue that pacing lodges words into the grooves they were made for. The very same seems itself in a lipless kiss you find, you name your being with, now a father, now an awning shading smiling flowers by the sea. And all the worst and all the thickest losses that may have robbed your sum of time here are gluts now glutted, now stoppered, stopped. It was a lottery you won the whole year round, the one day she birthed. And with a lightness of touch that proved your pen and maker of naught but ori off gauche and clanging sounds. Fatherhood is like a tree cut, then found again the same in the self same forest. Green is a gas with white as they mix in this the freshest sap of things. And I think I'll take a twig with me too, for truth, a souvenir. And I think this girl, my girl, is now my only final fear. Next one uh, is titled The Beach. And it records, as you may expect, um, uh, her first visit to the beach. This was in Dubai. Uh, just a kind of, uh, trying to kind of commemorate a moment or, or a small part of experience with my daughter and it's titled The Beach. So, her first footstep was a stop start, stop start. There was a certain groomed intelligence about the way she greeted the sand and the sea's plane before us was nothing but a feeling, a mood of moving green and a tapestry of water. The sky, a wall upon which it went, its tail of wide and horizontal stitch, a promise of sheer nude adventure, or like a long flat clock of ticking innocence by which things might be said and done. The future's way not and not and never a worry for the walking girl. And by the time the sun began to set, Finding us edited for homeward bound, she stood up, broke the sand again without a sound, and walked with me hand in hand, away from the unfinished business of the sea, away from the lip of the surf, away and away and away. And what was most incomplete about our walk through the sun-kissed day only arrived at the point of periwinkle night. Once more, there was a broken thought in sight. Right, I'll leave, Arita, um, this is another one I'm quite, I'm quite happy with, and it's in my collection, Playdate. Uh, again, it's for Alia. And it, I think it's, it's a straightforward poem, but I think also the title often um, gets the concept of, of what I'm trying to get across quite nicely, Playdate for Alia. When you share your space and toys and learn to hold your hand quiet and free in one single soulful effort from bad or worse habits, the ticks of childish envy, dotting thereby in comfort your dotty little eye. When you stride with that sure precision, the measure of what you own, a few small paces that turn to the size of harbingers, let us say, of a pedigree vision. Poems to speak your own most way, your name signing its lengths, lengthy stay to the finish of whatever odd job you later choose for your praise, 
your erstwhile song. Recall at the last this space I hope I share with a seeing poem of simple, easy care. Remember what it looked like to see all things from a nearly naked eye and recollect the spirit of your father's grace through so much time and space, suffering the blindfold, blindfolds of others. Right, one more, one or two more, if I may. I hope I have time. Yep. Yes. This one is titled On Digging. It makes direct reference and allusion in the poem to the famous, you know, early Seamus Heaney poem on digging, sorry, digging. Um, and um, it was something I wrote very quickly, but I think it worked immediately and there wasn't a need for revision. So it's, uh, it runs like this, on digging for my father, Muhammad Sabah, who's still alive, by the way. Uh, although the poem kind of fuzzes between the influence of Hini on this poem and my own father being an influence on my life. On digging. He passed many years ago now, parked and glossed. I teach his poems nearly every day. I trust the sparks of all his embers still glow, glimmer. I have to. And through the, eddy, through the eddies, the heartening ebb and flow of the rug and weave of all this time, textures pass in the company of the angles of the angel dark. I have realized the truth filled with the violin's mark, you know, the unlucky one, sublime perhaps, a thorough one that lasts. The years since have lifted the curse, and I feel better speaking to you now. The rasp of all the digging done, now as then, then as now, comes up 20 years away, and the effect, filmic, as it ever was. In this sunk, sunbit movie, though, the emanations revolve. Beams turned upwards, they ask. Okay. Um, I would like, please, just to read, if I may, one or two more. If I've got time, I, don't, I can't see. Uh, I'll read The Sacrifice, if I may. This is for my daughter, Alia. Uh, it was luckily, I was very pleased to have it, had it accepted for Acumen 100, the centenary issue, which just came by last May. And this is The Sacrifice for Alia, another Alia poem. For the lips of my daughter and what they might come to speak in time and what they might say in words bolder than the future, I'm ready to meet each rich sacrifice from out of the strange whole plenty given me, staggered by the gift as it evolved in staggered shades to this small crammed corner, this shrinking place where I'm closer now and close to being shriven of all in goldenness that was given. It seems that slotted here on the block, I have one more last decision to make for these fig colored lips, my daughters. And later when with harsh voice questions, they beggar me with the why of it. And I, less a single cause or coin left to make a sure reply. I'll simply say, I suffered to be touched with theft for the redder lips of my daughter. And then, even later, when they ask of my dear lips and what of mine, I'll simply say that once upon a time I had them, but that now there are none. Right. Um, do you want me to finish there or shall I read one more? What do you think? So Please you go tell ahead. Me. Oh, okay, good. Because I wanted to read, if I may, a poem. Uh, um, recently published in New Humanist, and it'll be a nice way of ending because it has an epigraph like my first poem from the Kava Fee had an epigraph. And it's called Broken Thought, and it has a small, very tiny epigraph, like a line and a half, from an R.S. Thomas poem titled All Right, which is a bit of a sarky romantic poem, and, it's, and it runs like this. I look, you look away. So here's Broken Thought. I see the wind's manner, its elegant reach through leaves, rustling them in their seat of pleasant air. You see the same wonderful movement, the eloquence of air, but hurried and hurried scent, like an invisible scourge. 
I cannot stay here long enough to teach you the ways of thought as it sits on air, empty, but for the barest wonder, bound with the sense of the actual and nakedness. Yes, I meant to teach it you, but now the urge for that has flown. A broken homes, a place for nothing to be thought, nothing to be known. Thanks, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to read some of my lyrics. And that, that's what they are, they're lyrics. Uh, Very much uh, so, yes. Yeah. Unashamedly, although shamefully, but unashamedly. No, 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 don't, ever, don't ever be ashamed of that. <laughs> Wonderful. And, and, and what beautiful poems, uh, beautiful poems. Uh, Somehow this is not enough to say about your, to your daughter and, and to the future. I think of Yeats's prayers for his son and his daughter. You know, and I think about poems one writes to, to the next generation and what they, they will carry and what, they will re, what will remain in them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank um, you so beautiful much. Beautiful work. Omar, uh, this is, of course, the first time I'm hearing you read aloud. And it's just wonderful to hear the sort of uh, the voice behind the poems because I've only read them mostly printed out of my printer because you send me these big manuscripts to read before they're published, sometimes to write blurbs for, and then when they've come out. So it's actually really, really good to hear them because when I read the poems on the page, they strike me as very traditional poems in the sense that a lot of them are rhymed. Um, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's quite a feat to, you know, sustain, I think, over a book length poem, book length uh, uh, piece, so, uh, you know, so many rhyme poems that work well and pitch perfect. Tell us, um, I mean, lyric, of course, they're all lyrics. I mean, that's, that's accurate, but tell us where, why the fascination for this particular form, because this is predominantly the form you use. Um, look, I think when I write poetry, um, it tends to come from a, from a, from an in, a musical inkling. I feel fresh somehow, something in me physiologically, biologically feels fresh. And I want to kind of, and I, sometimes I say that, um, it really doesn't matter what I'm writing about as long as I'm satisfying that musical inkling, that urge, you know, to kind of create a little machine or whatever you might want to call it of working words. Uh, but with my daughter, the hope is I've been able to kind of infuse it with reality, not just an artificial exercise in creating harmony, but also meaning something heartfelt. And I think once you said, I think recently you said very kindly in one of your blurbs, which you always very kindly give me, is that I, I have a certain tonality, which I kind of pride myself on, which is kind of what makes my poems, I hope, work. <laughs> this kind of harmonic, um, slightly out of date, like you said, traditional, um, musicality. And I always say this to people, but they laugh at me. But I think, you know, when I said shamedly, shamefully and, and unashamedly, it's quite difficult, as you suggest nowadays, to write in the lyric eye without seeming extremely presumptuous and extremely self important. But unfortunately, I can't help but do that because <clears throat> it's the way it comes out. I mean, I, when I write poetry, it's not self effacement I'm after, it's self expression. Um, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm kind of, I, I wish it wasn't that way. I wish I could write poems that are less, uh, as it were, going for their effects. But I tend to do that because that's the way I'm rigged um, in a way. Um, and, I, and I got to a stage in my life where I'm not gonna say to myself, you know, you've got to change. I'm gonna say, make a virtue of what you're good at. You know, that, so that's kind of how, yeah, my process. Yeah, no, very good. But I, uh, someone was just advising me that, you know, about my own poetry to 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 see what would happen if I get out of the lane I'm in, you know, if I cross over, I mean, or consciously, uh, I because we're always exploring as well, trying to sort of achieve that, uh, you know, what to perfection brought or whatever it is, you know, that you're trying to. So I'm wondering whether you have, despite the yes, making a virtue of of your strengths. Whether you are sometimes, whether you're intrigued by, by all the other side, you know. Well, I mean, Sudit Sud mentioned that I, mean, I write a lot of criticism, literary critical right. articles, essays, reviews, and so on. And um, I've written a book about Fiona Sampson's uh, work, actually, 
Oh. And the one thing I find wonderful about her work, which feeds into my kind of approach to poetry, globally speaking, is that when she does criticism of, in some of her books, she's not trying to say this is better than that. She's looking for what is the essence of what works? How does this work? This unique sensibility and therefore show it, I mean, display it. And I think I suppose I get my satisfaction from multiplicity or variety more from my critical writing, because I read loads of different kinds of poets, Sudeep included. Um, and I get my kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, appetite satisfied for variety from there. As a poet, um, you know, I'm quite erratic, if I'm being honest. You know, I write a lot. You know how they say when writers write too much. I tend to write too much, but but I but um, sometimes I, I, it works and I've got good work. And um, so I suppose my answer would be that no, I'm a lazy, indolent person who who likes his who likes what he's good at and tries to make a virtue of it. But I do explore in my critical work you know, other sensibilities and very, very much different ways of doing things with words. Um, and I do actually think one point to make, as a critical writer, I know we're doing poetry here today, I don't think it's separate from being a poet. You know, I think all the, all, all, all the ways you deploy language are configurative. You know, the way you connect the dots in an essay is just as poetic in terms of the kind of biology, physiology thing I mentioned rather weirdly earlier. You know, you're getting your same, the same kickback you know, that you're producing meaning from meaning. Um, and so, yeah, so I would say that, unfortunately, I'll never be perhaps um, the most adventurous poet, but I'm hoping to be a, an adventurous reader, nonetheless. Or maybe I'll learn next, maybe next year I'll change, I don't know. <laughs> I'm glad, Omar, you brought out the point that, you know, writing criticism and writing poetry are inextricably linked in the best of times, ideally. And um, good critical writing, and this is of course personal taste, uh, is something that is erudite, it's intelligent. At the same time, I don't have to run to a dictionary or you know, uh, to find the isms just because they're fancy things yeah. to you. But something that comes from the wealth of our reading and knowledge, so therefore we apply it theoretically. Uh, so there's a very lyrical quality about your critical writing as well. So uh, when people start reading your critical writing, they'll see that. But back to the poetry, uh, you use this phrase, what were you saying? Shame, shame, shamelessly and shamefully? Unashamedly. Animation. Unashamedly <laughs> and, and shamefully. So they reminded me of shamelessly, you know, because no. there's so much of so much of Seamus in your poetry in the way he wrote, wrote his poetry. It's earth bound, it's family bound. And I love, re I love all the new sequence about your daughter. I think your poetry has changed in a, in a significant way. It's become more humble, it's become softer because children do that, I think. There's some yeah, of this. Well, there's, there's a wonderful thing my a colleague of mine said a few years ago before when I was just having my child, she said, when I go home and I see my kids, they make me feel powerful or, or strong. They give me strength because, you know, they give you this sense of importance and it's, it's unconditional. And so in a way, I suppose you're right that when I'm writing about Alia, I don't need to pull, up, pull off kind of, you know, linguistic uh, sparks. I can be as mature, you know, what they call mature, you know, as humble, as, um, thankfully you said that, I mean, maybe I'm not, but, I can be as real as I want to be because it's the, the reality is there. You know, it's not about me manufacturing something. Um, and regarding the criticism, yeah, I think there is this, this, this thing where if you can explain an idea or an interpretation to your child, ideally or lucidly, then you've done a good job. So in a way, I think that good criticism uh, as, a, as a kind of poetry tries to mix the abstract and the concrete. And that's why it joins with my poetry, I suppose. Um, I suppose a, a good example would be uh, the lyrical ballads, for instance, you know, in a sense, uh, I mean, what they did. I mean, criticism at that time was in a sense how it should be. I'm not saying I don't like other kinds of writing and more dense writing, but in a sense that, yeah. But yes, 
Thank you, Omar. We'll Thank come you. back to you again. It was a real and, pleasure. Uh, Thank you so it, much. It's actually quite good to see two people, two <laughs> good or bad. I know I don't, I'm not making a positive or negative statement, but two out of the four poets are actually smoking on the screen. Sorry, sorry. A, no, 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 which is a, such a rarity. It's all right. You know, you're in your room and you can do whatever you want, but not that many people are, you know, people are generally fairly shy about the, 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 the smoking, the act of smoking itself. But we'll, well come back to that. Thank you, Omar. Smoking is not good for any kids out there. Sorry, and, I just and, had and, to say that. Shame, you know. Shamelessly smoking on screen. Yeah. <laughs> Unashamedly smoking. Well done. All right. Um, let me let me now introduce uh, um, uh, uh, our last poet, but not and our first poet and our last poet, uh, a wonderful poet, a, a dear friend, Luther Jett, who will, um, you know, I mean, I I came back from many years abroad as a diplomat. Uh, I mean, I'm still a diplomat, but I mean, I'm back in Washington since 2017, and really, the discovery of these these years. Uh, is is the poetry of Luther? I mean, he he impresses me with his uh, the wisdom uh, in in the lines, the control of the verse of the form, and and uh, he just writes uh, what he thinks about, what he feels, what he wants to share, and um, he's not too worried about the the career, so to speak. He's uh, he's a poet for poets and, and for readers. And I'm so glad to see his work starting to, to spread throughout the, not only the United States, but through the internet. Um, you know, let me say a few things. He's very modest in his, in his own remarks about himself. Uh, he's a native of Montgomery County, Maryland, and a retired special educator. His poetry has been published in many places, in many journals and several anthologies. And his poetry performance piece, Flying to America, debuted at the 2009 Capitol Fringe Festival in Washington, DC. He's the author of four poetry chapbooks. Now that word chapbook is, uh, I guess, a smaller version of a book, but I would call them books. Uh, not quite poems written in search of my father, from Finishing Line Press, Our Situation, uh, an amazing book that, a, a political book, pro pro from Prolific Press in 2018, Everyone Disappears, which I had the pleasure of writing a comment on, Finishing Line Press 2020, and the new uh, book, Little Wars from Kelsey Books in 2021. Luther also is a promoter of poetry, I call it this, uh, facilitating a monthly virtual open mic sponsored by the Hyattstown Mill Arts Project in Hyattstown, Maryland. And um, thrilled to also announce here that he will be reading in person to those of us listening in Maryland on August 30th at the Port-au-Prince restaurant where we'll be re-inaugurating the, the series, uh, Poetry at the Port on Monday, August 30th. Welcome Luther to this uh, international stage. Thank you for joining us. Go ahead. Welcome, welcome Luther. Thank, thank you, Indran and uh, Shadeep. Um, pleased to be here. Um, I'm gonna start with a very recent poem, but most of the poems I will read are from one or the other of my uh, two most recent uh, collections. Arson. The world is on fire and we, we are sad. Honeybees circulate among the wild bergamot, bush clover, lupine. Red-shouldered hawks keen through a sky so vivid, blue. You would not know that we are burning, but yes, at night, city streets erupt with gunfire. Somewhere children play in the rubble of bombed out buildings, their bellies distended from hunger, eyes alight. They have no words for what they have seen. A polar bear 
floats on an ice flow adrift in a rising sea. Yellow daisies bloom above the timberline where once the glaciers slept. Now here is a poem from uh, Everyone Disappears. I'll read a couple from that collection. Nepenthe. That time we were starving. One of us died. I don't remember whether it was you or me, but I'm certain the disappearance tore a hole in the continuum, and it doesn't take much now. A fragment of sky, a wall, the color of sunflowers, that path between the birches, miss one meal and all the other hungers rush in. Watch night's fingers grip the naked trees and see how lights flicker on only to fade out again. Yesterday, I went from room to room, all through the house, riffling drawers, unsealing boxes, searching for what cannot be found. For what? I have forgotten. And here is the eponymous, Why the Ocean Tastes of Tears. Everyone goes away. Everyone disappears. That should not surprise anyone. It comes with the ticking of clocks in upstairs halls, with the shadows of afternoons that turn golden before fading, and the last star left shining between the midnight west and bomb dark dawn. My mother cries at her kitchen sink, and the girl I argued with washes out her paintbrushes in a room I have never seen. Voices fill the air. Small birds go south. The snow melts. Slowly, everyone disappears when you most want them to stay. Everyone goes somewhere else, and that is why the ocean tastes of tears. It's the one thing you can count on. When you close your eyes, you dream, and if anyone is still there when you wake, you've witnessed a revolution. Now here is a poem from uh, Little Wars. Ach du. Oh you, and you, and you, with your little wars, what do I know? I was on my way to the dry cleaner when the news came. No, I was making coffee and no, no, I just slipped out the door. When the phone rang, the radio announcer interrupted my favorite song. The planes flew over too low. They rattled my windows. And you, and you, and no, I didn't know. The war inside you, the war you didn't know. You had just stepped outside to take a call. Yes, and the planes, yes. Then the coffee went cold, milk turned sour, that song you were writing, the window shattered, spray of glass, and you, and you, and I, and no, we didn't know there are no little wars, no distance we cannot reduce to nothing. 
I like to flip between my collections. So this is from the other book, Holding. Things shatter with the force of holding too long in one place. Ease up on that throttle grasp before you choke. The air that day was tuned a crystal pitch, and then the smoke. Paper strips feathered from the sky, and on each strip a name inscribed. If you paused to count them one by one, the dust could swallow everything. A word burns when held back, as if a searing coal lodged in the throat, cast down from unimagined height, and might one word atone for everything? Write this, then, in your ledger, where you keep your darker dreams. After the lava cools, there is glass obsidian, smooth, black, and keen, which gripped two closely cuts, and red seeps over everything. Here is a war story. Here is the book with torn pages. Only half remains to be deciphered. And here is the house with burnt rooms and a few fading photos scattered across the floor. And here, here, forgive me, but these are my bones. This is the face I was using. Wrap them all tenderly. Sing of me as you sleep. I think I do have time for two more then. Or three. Yes, go ahead. You have time. Okay. Um, red dirt. This is the hell of it. The injury comes apparent in each step across the beaten earth. The wound we make of breathing. There is no life which in the end does not depend on death. Carnivore cells consume all in their paths. Fungus feeds upon decay. Even flowers cannot bloom by sunlight's soul behest, requiring rot broken leaves, faded petals. Do you imagine to do better than the poppies of the field? You who scatter seed across continents, each orgasm is a little death, each song a requiem. Simply rising of a morning is to undertake a battle pitched against unending night. Red dirt collects in every crevice of the skin and never will scrub clean. The soldier in his bivouac dreams himself at war with time and starts awake to scan a ragged horizon marking the slow paling down the sky. Neither he nor I nor you can claim to know the day ahead, although the watcher on the border watching back, we know well as we know ourselves. This is a very old poem. You can tell by the title, Real America, Autumn. 1994, 
over a quarter of a century. There is a lake and there is a highway and the sky is reflected in the lake and the wind moves over the blue waters. There is a tall building beside the lake and the cars pass on the highway and people are walking on the path around the lake and it is autumn and the sun shines on the lake and on the building, on the people and on the cars passing on the highway in the afternoon. And we do not know who lives in the building and we do not know how the lake came to be here between the building and the highway and we do not know how long the sun will shine and we do not know where all the cars are going we do not know where we are going or how long it will take and we do not know who we are only that we are and the lake is and the highway is and the building and the path and the wind and the sun this autumn day in america and i'll close with a very very short poem hold let go there is darkness and there is light somewhere dawn opens the sky even while here night closes her fist no eye is shut so tight a star's kiss won't pierce it thank you very much thank you thank you so much Luther. what a magnificent finish that that last poem, no eye shut so tight, the star's kiss won't pierce it. Beautiful reading. I'm going to leave you with Sadiq for a minute because I have something that's come up here. I'll be right back. Thanks. Go ahead, Sadiq. Ruta, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. It, it, it's always very useful to have read the poems before, which is why I write to all the authors. Sorry. Uh, the world, uh, and uh, also, it's I think fairly helpful to see the poems on the side. Um, a lot of poetry, of your poetry is very narrative. Um, it's sort of storytelling in a way, but when you read it out, you read it with a sort of mellifluous tone, which is almost troubadourish. Is that something that you, it comes naturally to you because you're a performance poet as well, or at least from the bio I read you, hold uh, an event or a series? Well, I do think um, poetry had its start as performance. You know, it, 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 poetry predates written language. Absolutely, yeah. So I think it is important to present it that way. Um, to present it orally is to go back to our 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 roots as um as witnesses um you know i uh, i am also a singer songwriter so that probably also creeps in there a little bit it's funny that you would say that my work is narrative because i really don't think of it as being narrative and then of course i title things like a war story, you know, uh, but I really don't think of it as narrative. I just, I, I just think of it as, um, as, 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 as bearing witness. Hmm. And so, how, how does the songwriting creep in? Um. Well, they're really two different genres. But I think that when I'm reading, um, there's a melody in 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 the words, even if even if it's not apparent. Um, songwriting is a is is a very different challenge, though, um, b 
because you really are constrained in a way and and being constrained is not a bad thing i can't formal poetry eludes me a lot i have written many many sonnets across the course of my life and only two have i ever felt were successful you know so i, I work that out in songs instead but your last poem uh, hold let go in a sense can lend itself more easily to a song because a songs tend to be short in mm -hmm. terms of lyrics you know because I, I work a lot with uh, songwriters myself and theater people and um, always it's the song the singers and the composers they said no 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 not the long poems we need the short poems and the challenge of course is when i tell them that listen no refrains you're not going to cut it paste and chop the poem because if you can take the whole poem and make a song out of it fine so do you do you have those challenges or do you keep it to the two separate compartments um, um yeah. most mostly it's two separate compartments every once in a while i cross over but not very much yeah indran's busy um So anybody else has any questions? Now we can open it up to the audience. The, um, Omar? Now yes. this is the time for, this is the time for poets to talk to each other. If you have any queries or words of praise, um, I would say just go and buy tons no. in the 12 copies of each book of each poet and <laughs> gift it to your friends. But yes, I Omar, was, go ahead. I was particularly interested in Arundhati's um, comments about the sacred um, or repartee with you about the sacred. Um, because uh, when I think of the sacred, I think of something that is before and beyond all language. You know, it's not representational. When I think of the sacred, I think perhaps you might say less of a mythological god, more of the you know the one god idea. Um, and I, I'm just curious to know, you know, is perhaps the more I don't want to. Say, this is not any evaluative comment, but the more pagan version of the idea of god, is it more um, susceptible? to poetic representation, because it is, because the gods, and if we look at the Greek gods, the Roman gods, I don't know much about the Indian pantheon, but I do know that, um, you know, obviously they're, they're more human. They, they, they have features like us, they meld into us, as opposed to some pure theological, you know, one God idea as being kind of the background to everything of reality rather than one of part of reality. So how do you connect the two ideas of the sacred, the sacred as myth, as culture, as tradition, and the sacred, what I'm talking about, which is the more kind of monotheistic idea, which is not, uh, you know, can't be supposedly represented or representational. Does it, fe does it feature in your work as well? I mean, just... The, the, word, the, the word mono is, you know, you, the, the key is in the word mono. I mean, I, I let uh, Arundhati talk as well, but when you're coming from a tradition like ours, um, Western gods, in quotes, largely tend to be unipolar with very fixed attributes. Right. Maximum, they'll be bipolar, if I may use the word, <laughs> you know, in Yang or Zeus, you know, whatever, you know? Right. The gods from our part of the world are complicated creatures. They're beautifully intimate. They're human. At the same time, they are deified as clay sculptors, except that, for instance, you know, take, take a goddess like Durga, um, who's one of the um, uh, avatars of, um, of Kali, Vishnu, uh, sorry, uh, Shiva, Brahma, uh, Vishnu, all three sort of godheads, you know, the creator, preserver, and destroyer. And so to speak, her consort would be uh, Kali, Durga, Parvati. So 
when Durga Puja, Puja is the festival, is celebrated, you know, one part of it is very, very formal, the chants are formal, people dress formally, colorfully, albeit colorfully, but formally. At the end, the gods are carried by the human hands and we immerse her in the water and she melts in the water and quite unscientifically, she's supposed to go upstream back to the Himalayas to be with a husband or with a family. So there's a very different kind of emotion that we invest because you know, for us, gods are not just gods. You know, it's not that you go to a silent church. For us, cacophony is very much part of godliness and ungodliness. Right. So I just thought I'd just say all this because it's important to uh, reimagine the idea of what sacred is. Arundhati, maybe you can take that on further. Yes. No, it's, uh, it's interesting. I'm glad you brought in the notion of the pagan as well, uh, Omar. I think it's certainly true that, you know, in the tradition that I spoke of earlier, the bhakti tradition, the sacred is conceived often in two ways. One is beyond form, beyond name, pointing perhaps to what you're suggesting, which is a notion of an absolute, but unnameable, right. indescribable, beyond all perception. And the sacred is also equally validly presented as embodied, as with name, with form, with family, with a vehicle, you even know his blood group. I mean, it's that level of particularity. And what, to my mind, is the most interesting thing about this tradition today, when we look at it, is its richness, its texture that both of you have invoked. Excuse me. Because when did you arrive? I think we're eavesdropping. Because I was behind this person. No, I, I was here. It was here. No. So, what is interesting to my mind about this texture that we have today and this, just this variety of gods and goddesses is that the particular in the bhakti traditions of this country can be seen as a springboard to something much larger, to the beyond. But it is this very particular shrine for this particular poet that might be the key to the beyond. So there's an unapologetic evocation of this concreteness, which then becomes a doorway to something more. But each one is allowed their key, their doorway. That wow. is the way in which the many-sidedness of the, of the tradition sits almost cheek by jowl and seamlessly with this notion of the beyond, the unnameable beyond. Well, that's so fascinating also, because the one way I also, think... Oh, sorry. Sorry, Omar, I, just to insert one more comment. Also, the tr our tradition is a lot older than, say, the Western tradition. You see, so that plays its part. So because it's older and, say, Christianity is a younger religion, if I have to bring in another religion, then Hinduism is a kind of religion, say, which encompasses Buddhism, Jainism. Um, there are parts of our um, uh, scriptures which can easily be found in, Christ in the Christian scriptures or the, uh, or the Quran, because essentially, uh, so many of these could be subsets of that. So in a sense, and I'll give you a small example of how we live it. I went to a Christian Missionary School, St. Columbus School in Delhi. So we, I started the day with the Lord's Prayer, Our Father in Heaven, Holy Be Thy Name, and that. And, you know, I come back and then there's a cacophony of other gods and goddesses. My mother is praying in her prayer room in the evening. Of course, as a child, you know, you don't want to go there because it's very uncool and, you know, but what, it, what does it do? It actually makes it homely, so to speak, because it's part of a daily ritual. You, you, you may or may not want to take part in it. But it also gives you the oral, A-U-R-A-L cadences that seep into you in an osmotic fashion. So there's that as well. Yeah. So it's complicated, but go ahead. Well, what I think was interesting about what you're both saying is uh, specifically Arundhati about the, the particular, the concrete, the, the fluke or the surd being the source of the absolute. 
There's a book by, you know, Christian Wyman, I think he's a wonderful poet, former editor yeah, yeah. of poetry, called My Bright Abyss, which is his meditation on being a Christian in a certain circumstance in his life. And what he stresses on following certain theologians, who I then read because I was so fascinated by this whole notion, is that it's the non-romantic, the non-necessity, the non-closure giving element of life that is, the so that is sacred, not the it all makes sense now and you know, it all fits the concepts and rationalizations. And I do think this is something I've realized in my own life. The older you get, when you're young, 20 or something, you're looking for answers, you're why, 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 and you want to necessitate reality. The older you get, the more you see light of life. And I'm not that old, I hope, but it's more why not that is the that is the truer question, or rhetorically, why not? And I think that why not is about poetry and, uh, and the sacral and poetry. That, the most random thing can be the source of everything, even though it doesn't seem like it was pre-planned to be that way, or there's an agenda for it to be that way. So yeah, um, I do think there's a, there's a strand, even in the monotheistic religions, as far as I've, uh, Christianity in particular, which I'm interested in, um, that does stress the contingent, the fluke, the non-romanticized version as the truth of what is beyond. Um, and I think some of the best writing, poetry or fiction, uh, is, I mean, unfortunately, when I look at my poetry, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but the, the ones that really don't work are because I have an agenda. You know, I, I've got an answer given and I'm representing it on the page. Whereas the best poems, are, as we all know, are slightly, slightly more indeterminate. They allow for room for the readership and the listeners to have their own ingress into it. Um, so I, let, let me come in there. I mean, my apologies earlier, an emergency took place at home here and I, it's, it's sort of under control, I think now. Uh, my apologies for having had to go away for a few minutes. But you mentioned agenda and I think, I think and, I, and I'm thinking back to uh, Luther's Our Book, Our Situation and then, and the political poem. And I think, I don't know if you've already discussed this, but I think it, uh, I didn't get a chance to ask about where Luther, you 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 fall on that now at this time in 2021, as we are facing the climate uh, bomb and uh, it's exploding, and and as we are uh, coming out of uh, Trump and and uh, in the United States, and we're facing the fall of Afghanistan and and so on and, and many other things. What is our situation in 2021? Your book came out in 2018, but I'm wondering how you would up to update it today and 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 just and and picking up on the notion of the agenda and whether the agenda uh, should be or should not be in the poem um which uh, just relating to almost comment about agenda go ahead luther if you don't I, mind um i'm not sure that we're really out of the trump era uh he seems to still be at large um you know, so there's that. I think, well, I'll, 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 I'll respond in, in two ways. One is that I think that if I were to update our situation, I would incorporate more poems like Arson that uh, confront and, and, and that, that, that confront our um, situation from an ecological perspective with uh, the world is literally, I mean, I didn't make up that, it's not a metaphor. The world is literally on fire right now. Um, thousands of my, square miles of uh, tundra and taiga are burning in Siberia right now as we speak, and we hardly even know about this. Um, but I will also say as kind of a teaser that a year from now, if we are all still here, um, I will actually be releasing a follow-up to our situation, which will be um, another collection of, um, of more overtly political uh, poems. Um, so there's that. I think that I think that poetry cannot really escape the political anyway. Um, you know, we are, we are charged with bearing witness, and that means paying attention to the political, whether we want to or not. But isn't it all poetry? I think, on some level? I think, yeah, I was actually going to tell, bring Mark in. I've just put on the chat box Go ahead, uh, Mark, the yeah. fourth part of uh, the poem, Ulysses, where you say, the companion you feared the most 
on the other side of the century, the ghost of someone you know who had the nuance of a spork. My, what big eyes you have. I mean, you know, this is bearing witness in the best possible poetic way. Mark, I think you should take have the last word. Well, Could you be openly quiet? Thank you, Sudhi. Um, well, I mean, for me, all poetry that I write anyway, um, has, has to do with the search, should search for the spiritual, um, whatever lies beyond. Um, I think, um, you know, Omar said at one stage, or, or was it Indran about, no, I think it was Omar who said about the gatekeeper. Um, but anyway, so, so in a way to like sort of open new realms of possibility in terms of thinking, um, because in a way what, what we poets do is um, we, we, we bring the world to its concision, sort of this kind of uh, microscopic, sometimes also ma macroscopic, but often microscopic uh, analysis of uh, what makes our atoms breathe or vibrate. Um, and <clears throat> everything is affected by everything else. Um, you know, we know the whole thing about the butterfly creating a tidal wave. Um, I mean, the, the Taoists had a lot to say there, for example. Um, but um, I think all, all poetry is innately political. Um, even if you're writing about butterflies, you know, on an open meadow. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do agree that it's very necessary to address the issues of the day um, in, in whatever way you can, uh, whether you be a poet uh, or a musician or a dancer or, a, or an actor or any creative person, you know, uh, also in the sciences as well. You know? um, I mean, the strides we have made that we don't even know about, you know? For example, it is absolutely possible to feed the whole planet with electricity without raping the earth. Um, if, you know, the big countries got together, sent up a, a giant satellite array, capture the sun's rays, beam it down to earth, energy problems solved for the next thousand years, probably, you know, and it's, it's possible. We have the technology to do it. Um, so what the hell are these oil corporations still, you know, roiling around for? I, I, I don't get it. You know, why? I mean, haven't we progressed beyond this point? Yeah, I think it'll be, I think a good start would be the vaccine if it's sort of distributed free all around the world. But having said that, yes, you know, this is one of the things of PWSI, you know, the engagement, the poetry reading is part of it, bringing together different voices is part of it, bringing, forging new friendships is an important part of it. So you'll have four new friends if you've not known each other before. But the more important part, which, and all of us individually participate in so many poetry reading seminars and workshops, but where I feel almost always, very rarely, it's not the case, but most of the time, there's very little serious engagement around each other's work. And I think that's the key for this particular series that Indran and I run and the other one, Conclave, which Fiona and I run um, on the second Tuesdays and second Saturdays of every month. But I think we always almost, <laughs> we go over time because we start off saying it's gonna be one and a half hours, 15 minutes of pure reading and enough time for conversation, which is 15 minutes, but it's usually at least two hours. So I think it's um, 1040 in Delhi. I think my partner is gonna scream if I don't heat up food for her and feed her. So very soon I have to say goodbye, but Luther, Omar, Mark, Arundhati, it was a sheer, sheer pleasure and joy to listen to all four of you. And yeah. I'm so pleased that Don Krieger was suddenly showing his face because he's a terribly modest man. Don and Indran, you know, we form this triumvirate and make this happen every month. So I'm really yeah. grateful to not only all of you, but my colleagues and friends. And Indran, if you wish to say something, and Don, just if you to, wish. To just to say thank you very much to, to all of you and, and for reading and sharing your work and, uh, and engaging. Uh, this this in this in this space thank you very much and let's look forward to uh, to the next one uh, always the second saturday of every month 
and um, thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, and I'm sorry, this is, I'm just intervening to say this. You know, one has done so many readings in this whole Zoom era, and there are some that are special and resonant, and this was one of them. It doesn't happen too often. So thank you. It certainly has a lot to do with what you mentioned, Shadeep, the attentiveness of your response and endurance to each of uh, each poet. That made a huge difference. The poems alongside the reading, I realize actually make an enormous different, difference. And that was also very thoughtfully done, but also to each of the poets, because it was really, um, and I don't mean this as some kind of uh, cliche. I, I mean this quite truly. It was truly a feast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Take care Thank and care. help at least five other people to vaccinate. Get your rich friends to do it. Okay. Sounds good. All the very best. All the best. Cheers. Bye bye. Good Thank night. you. Good night. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Bye bye.